So hello everybody, welcome to our second live event that we're doing as part of Black History Month. So we've got Karen and Harold here for, for us who are going to do a talk about Black History and Art. Um, so thank you for them to, for joining us and for putting this together for us. Thanks so much Rachel and um, welcome everybody. Um, welcome to our conversation with artist Harold of Fay. Um, firstly, my name is Karen Thomas and I'm Community Officer for Kettle Yard in Cambridge. Today I'm delighted to be joined by Harold. I'm going to shortly introduce Harold and ask a few questions. But as Rachel said, please do have a think about your own questions that you'd like to ask and submit them via the Q&A bottom at the bottom of the, your screen there. You might need to wiggle your mouse and, and it will appear in the toolbar. Um, so there'll be an opportunity to ask some of these at the end of our chat. So I've had the wonderful pleasure of working closely with Harold in 2017 when he was selected by communities in North Cambridge to be their third open house artist in residence with Kettle's Yard. He worked with Kettle Yard and folks in Arbury and King's Hedges throughout the year, exploring design and meaning inspired by the house and collection at Kettle Yard. Howard Offay is an artist living in South Cambridgeshire and works nationally and internationally through a range of media, including performance, video, photography, learning and social arts practice. He particularly explores historic narratives and contemporary culture. Recently, Harold has worked with Tate Britain, Tate Modern, South London Gallery, Wising Arts Centre and Kettle Yard. He's also worked in New York, France and Japan, just to make, name a few. Um, additionally, very busy Harold, um, currently teaches at universities in both Leeds and in London. So good afternoon and welcome, Harold. Hey, hi Karen. Uh, it's really great to be here. Um, thanks to everyone for, for tuning in um, and yeah, looking forward to the conversation. So I've given you a very, very brief introduction. But perhaps you could tell us a little bit more about what inspires you to make art. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, I think the reason I'm an artist is that I'm sort of curious. I'm sort of really curious about the world and particularly curious about people. And um, I think I realized, I was lucky enough to realize quite early on in school that um, doing art allowed you to explore questions. It uh, allowed you to learn because it was very much about you like framing or posing questions and then finding ways of not necessarily answering them, but exploring them, researching them. Um, and I think what I've increasingly found is that um, it's, it's really interesting and useful to share those questions with other people and see what questions they have. Um, so, yeah. Curiosity is, yeah. is an important, important thing, I think, mm. for all of us. Mm. Um, Definitely. So that so curiosity is what inspired you, but then kind of thinking more about practical mm. ways, how do you choose what media you then use to create your artwork? Um, like, I don't know whether it's photography or film or performance. I mean, that must be a, a really difficult decision. Yeah, I mean, I think um, in, in some ways, uh, you know, I mean, different artists have different approaches. You know, some artists are very invested in materials, you know, whether they're, you know, I don't know, you know, working with like wood or bronze or obviously sort of paint. And, um, and I think uh, I've never sort of really been like that. I guess I've been more interested in um, situations and ideas. And then often what comes out of that is an opportunity to work in a particular way. Um, I mean, I have sort of, sort of most often work with like photography and video and and performance um, and often think about ways in which I might like role play things or, or um, test things out. And I'm interested in like photography and documenting and portraiture. Um, but yeah, I mean, other projects have allowed me to, for example, you know, explore ceramics and, and make objects. I mean, that was one of the things we did as part of Open House, which I'm sure we'll talk about later, um, which is sort of Kettle's Yard initiative that 
allowed me to work with um, communities in North Cambridge. So that was a really exciting opportunity to kind of sort of, you know, do something like that. And there are occasions where I make sculptures and I've worked with textiles. Um, so I really enjoy the variety. The variety is really important for me. Yeah. Does that kind of keep it fresh for you then? Like a new challenge of working with a different material? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I think that that freshness is really important. And sometimes I've just sort of found that it can be useful as well. Like what I don't know can be useful. So, yeah, so definitely doing the kind of, um, you know, open house, um, like being able to do like ceramics, which, you know, I mean, I did at school and I always enjoyed, but I don't really get a chance to kind of, like, you know, really make ceramics or glaze things and um so that idea of shared learning is really important to me where um i'm often sort of working with people that um you know might have skill or or, or we're together we've never done it before and um it's like a leveler which is i think is really important it's really interesting um so you've kind of mentioned your um residency with kettle shard through the open house program but you've also undertaken res residencies at um wising arts center um so how does working in cambridgeshire inspire you um that's a good question i mean uh i think i mean i've been living in cambridge and now just um in south cambridgeshire um for, it's coming up to, it'll be seven years in February and it's gone quite quickly. And I think what, um, I mean, I came from London um, and I think what I've been really heartened by is just the kind of like um, diversity and variety of people and places and situations that, you know, that's here in a relatively sort of small area. Um, and, uh, I think I've been really lucky through, particularly through these residencies with Kettles Yard and, and Wising Arts Centre, in that they've become platforms for me to meet some of the most extraordinary people, you know, um, and organisations as well. Um, so I think I feel like I'm really privileged in that I've got, um, had these amazing experiences and insights into um, individual people's stories or histories. Um, uh, people who are working in really interesting ways, um, often who've come from very different divergent sort of backgrounds. Um, it's like a very rich place actually, um, sort of culturally, you know. Um, yeah, so that, that's, that's been really inspiring and continues to be as well, yeah. So is there, um, I mean, without naming names, are there particular people that you've met through those residencies that, or moments in those residencies that stand out for you? Um, I mean, I think, I mean, definitely, I think a standout moment was the kind of um, outcome of my residency with Open House and Kettle's Yard, um, where we sort of staged this like gathering festival uh, at North Cambridge Academy. And that brought together, I think, lots of um, the organisations and individuals that we've been kind of working with. And I, I think just because it was such a big platform and there were so many people, um, you know, uh, I think I was really sort of taken aback. Um, I mean, there's an organisation called Rowan that we worked with, it was like just amazing. Um, and um, I don't know, one of the things I was sort of a bit sort of sad about is that I kind of, you know, um, maybe I should just, I just, you know, the project was really great over, I mean, it was nine months, I think, or maybe even, two, I don't, I can't remember, but um, I mean, looking back at it now, it was quite short and I, I really enjoyed those kind of conversations, regular conversations that kind of came about and, um, uh, and being sort of like, feeling a little bit part of, um, these existing communities um but yeah oh god I mean there's so many I'm not I'm not mentioning I mean there's loads of um just even ind individual people as well they're really just generous with their time and um sort of just relaying their own experiences and stuff yeah I could, I could go on 
my enduring memory of the um, open house gathering is um, of course the amazing artworks there was lots and lots of food which was delicious that people bought and shared um, delicious bread that was being made by another artist Anna Brownstead um, but it was also really rainy <laughs> and all of these people came out and were so like excited to share everything that they've made with Harold through that year despite torrential rain so <laughs> <laughs> no it was kind of classic because we had this amazing marquee so everyone was like huddled in this live marquee um during the right it was like I don't know something very British about that you know, it was. Like, huddled in a marquee while it's like really pouring outside but um <laughs> but in some ways I think it brought people together it was really great and um I mean um Eddie from Cambridge Ad um African Network as well really supported that project and we had some great um, Ghanaian performers as well which I was uh, which was a, a real highlight for me on top of the food as well yeah so that was really great experience. Yeah, it was such a celebration so thank yeah. you yeah people come together in adversity don't they mm. um, <laughs> So recently, um, through another project with Kettle's Yard, you've been sharing your Reflections from Home, which is uh, Project Kettle's Yard, have, have invited artists to kind of share their experiences of working from home. And um, in that, you talk about creating photographs in your garden during lockdown mm -hmm. and a strand of your practice, which concerns the politics of posing and the visibility of the black body. And I believe that this is something you'll be bringing to us at Kettle Yard in January as part of their forthcoming exhibition, Untitled. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I mean, this is a really like long ongoing project that I've been doing, it's, it's over 10 years, since 2008, um, sort of where I've been really interested in looking at album covers in particular and how like um, sort of black performers, black singers are using the album cover to represent themselves through the photography, through the album artwork. Um, and particularly looking back at this period of the 70s and 80s, where there's like a sort of, for me, like a heightened consciousness about, um, it might be uh, sort of black power or black pride or celebration or assertiveness. Um, uh, there's an opportunity to really think about how um, these performers are presenting themselves to audiences through these poses particularly, how do they pose and what does that mean? And so the series sort of started out by looking at, um, you know, singers like Grace Jones, mostly kind of like, it was mostly women to begin with and, and um, uh, soul singers. Um, and the series that we're showing at Cattle's Yard is, is those series of female singers, um, soul, from soul, disco genres. Um, and then more recently through, I mean, maybe I could, this is an opportunity just to very quickly share. Um, okay. Um, just so people have a bit of a reference. Hopefully people can see this. Yeah, I can see that. Hopefully okay, yeah. Can. yeah, most recently it's turned to this series of album covers that I found of like uh, 80s male soul singers. So this is Teddy Pendergrass. And this album cover, I'm just really interested in like how... Um, you know, particularly at this period, singers like Mark, um, Lionel Richie, Michael Jackson, I mean, this is a, a kind of bigger spread, but they're all adopting the same pose, which is this reclining pose. Um, so it's an image of sort of black men trying to kind of project through uh, these album covers, these photographs, something about their identity. Obviously album covers are to promote music and to draw people to the music, but it's interesting when this similar pose, I think, is kind of used. Um, so I've been just really interested in what, what you know, this pose says about like, um, you know, blackness and masculinity. And, and for me, it's often, it's very 80s, you know, this idea of kind of being sophisticated and relaxed. And it's about, you know, a certain kind of power. For me, it's interesting the pose in art history um, Western art history has a kind of long, you know, you'll see like Roman sculptures of reclining figures or Renaissance paintings, um, uh, or, you know, even like Henry Moore sculptures. So it's a kind of power pose. Um, and then what I did on the residency at Wising, so these are just photographs of me 
at Wising, um, which is a sort of rural setting just outside of Cambridge, is just like uh, reenacting these poses and presenting them in like, um, you know, different locations in the countryside and seeing how it changes it to kind of like put it in a different, slightly different kind of context. And then just very lastly, what I've also been doing as well at various opportunities is inviting other people is extending the conversation to, to like perform the pose. So um, working with um, a good friend and collaborator of mine, Eloise Calandra, we set up this st studio just with a backdrop and we're inviting different people to kind of like perform this Teddy Pendergrass pose and interpret it. So we've got like this collection of um, different people kind of performing these poses. Um, so yeah, it's just some small photographs. It's so here. amazing. It's so interesting them um, doing the same pose, but some of the participants look super comfortable and relaxed, yeah. and then other ones look so tense yeah. and yeah. and uncertain. Yeah. How did you feel doing that pose? Um, I think what well, well the, thing, the the particularly that Teddy Pendergrass pose is that it sort of looks like really relaxed because that whole thing about lying down is you're like chilled out and you know being in control but it's really uncomfortable because it's yeah. slightly awkward the way that he crosses his leg over the other leg and then this whole thing about doing that and the elbow with the way so it's it's not actually that comfortable to do for, but um but I guess I was interested in like repeating it over and over again and seeing how it works when you put it in slightly unusual spaces or like, you know, um, yeah. So, I mean, and then obviously, yeah, I'm really interested in how other people have interpreted it. And yeah, some people being really uncomfortable. I should, I should just say that they chose to do, we had like three or four <laughs> poses and people could choose which ones they wanted to do. So it was not me asking them to do that against my will. Um, yeah, I think some people were quite surprised or yeah, less uncomfortable than they might. Yeah, the leg thing, I just look at you do, I thought, oh, that's actually very high up the, the leg that you're kind of crossing over. Yeah. I don't know, you have to add it to the yoga. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's probably a good, like, yoga pose. I mean, it's kind of just, like, lots of stretching. <laughs> <laughs> Might not be able to get out of it again, that's the only yeah. worry. Not something you'd Wait. want to do on the sofa for a while, though. No. <laughs> <laughs> So clearly, like from the images that you've shown us, um, collaboration, interaction is a really important part of your practice. But so how have you managed to do that when we're all being asked to be physically distant from each other? Is that still possible? It is. I mean, it's difficult. I mean, I think it's, it, I think uh, like everyone else, and I'm sure you feel the same, it, you sort of, it's made me realise the kind of, you know, the kind of quality of like being in the same space and, sharing the immediacy of being in that same space as other people but but yeah I mean I think what's happened is obviously like everyone else it's kind of um been replaced by conversations like we're having now over 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 zoom and other platforms and um I think that's been interesting actually because it's um it's been a space where you're able to be a bit more kind of reflective perhaps and obviously you know, with the various kind of lockdowns, people have been really thinking about their situations and um, and that's sometimes led to, I think, hopefully more intimate or open kind of conversations about how we're kind of feeling. Um, so, yeah, a bit of that has sort of transferred and, um, I mean, I've had a few projects that have been kind of postponed, but they've been replaced by sort of conversations um, which have been really productive actually and there's been lots of sharing and exchanging of knowledge and references which is also a really good thing. And is that with other artists or with the public or a mix? Uh, a mix, yeah, a mix, um, which is, well, yeah, which has been really good, you know, and um, I guess one thing about even like working with sort of um, audiences and the public is that um, in, in some of the projects actually we've been able to bring people together who wouldn't necessarily be able you know like from different locations so people in different okay. cities or um we've been able to kind of sort of bring them together through this um through things like zoom um yeah so that that's that's been a kind of upshot um a minor one but you know it's been it's been good 
Yeah, um, I know. I th actually think this, this time last year you were over in Japan, and um, that was my first experience of doing a remote um, <laughs> event because you were leading a, a, a performance at, at Kettle Yard as, as part of the Cambridge show then. Um, and it was really interesting. It was a steep learning curve, and now it's like second nature that we're all kind of linked together through the internet and um, uh, art is happening in this way and creativity is happening in this way and conversations are happening in this way and it's really exciting um, so you were there ahead of us all world. <laughs> Um, just a reminder to everybody at home that you can submit questions via the Q&A um, so just tap your bot the, on the toggle bar at the bottom you can tap away and we'll get around to asking those very shortly um, I've got a couple of other questions Harold um, so I know that you've talked before that you've been really heartened by the discussion of decolonization um, and sharing resources and, and readings in in light of the um, Black Lives Matter movement um, and I know our partners at South Cambridge District Council have also like recommended readings and other resources mm -hmm. as part of Black History Month are there any particular works which you would recommend to others to read and watch? Ah, no, just, give me, I'm just going into the... Into the, the my, uh, <laughs> but, um, I've just acquired, I haven't actually properly started reading it, but somebody recommended to me, um, if, um, hold on, I might have to turn my background off because you're not going to say... No, no, you're not going to say... Anyway, uh, <laughs> it's a beautiful <laughs> story though. <laughs> I'm not actually hiding it. It's, it's <laughs> Let me just switch the, the background off. Um, okay, yeah. So there's this book, which, uh, hold on, if people can see, um, is called De Decolonising the Camera Photography in Racial Time by Mark Seeley, um, who's a really great writer, curator. Um, and the book is kind of really looking at like the history of photography in relation to um depictions of 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 the black body depictions of black people through portraiture and thinking, thinking thinking about that and and also thinking about how artists then have also thought about kind of uh representing um in you know um what what does it mean to be photographed as a black subject you know um so i really recommend that and and there's some really good um you know, like historical references, so thinking about things like kind of colonial photography, um, but then also thinking about kind of like early black photographers as well, um, who are kind of sort of taking control of kind of sort of image making. Um, yeah, I'd recommend that. And, um, um, Sorry, I wasn't not adding this. Uh, as well, and this is also a really great book by um, it's by uh, this Malian photographer from Mali called uh, Malik Sedebe, um, who was a studio photographer in the 60s and 70s. So in Bamako, in uh, Mali, he was sort of taking photographs of kind of sort of, you know, um, you know, people out, dancing, um, you know, groups of friends, um, um, you know, people, even people sort of just kind of sort of swimming. So it's a real kind of like amazing kind of depiction of sort of like every day. Uh, I love this one, people doing the twist, <laughs> holding up a James Brown album. <laughs> um, yeah, just kind of a really kind of great insight into the kind of, um, these West African, oh, this is a brilliant one of like these performers with these flares. Oh um, my gosh, yeah. that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think, I mean, that, you know, while that is not explicitly about, de it's interesting, Malik Sedebe is actually this generation of photographers that were depicting decolonized Africa. So in that immediate period when African countries were becoming independent. So. For me, there's also an important thing about recognizing these practices, I think, that emerged in the post-colonial period as well. And um, unfortunately, Malik Sadabe just very recently died, but, um, you know, into his 80s, he's beginning to kind of be recognized for this kind of rich documentary photography 
Um, so we have this amazing archive, I think, of kind of um, images. And there, I mean, there are other, lots of other photographers as well. Um, I think that that for me is also kind of part about the, vis the visibility, part of the decolonial, oh. decolonizing project is about the visibility of these kind of performers and voices that have sort of like presented. Beautiful images. Thank you for showing. Just to get on and on the on the bookstore online and have a look. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we've had a few questions um, being shared, and do keep on sharing. Um, we've had one from Adele. Um, Adele asks or says, um, "Social arts is on the rise, um, particularly through the pandemic." Um, or e.g. the pandemic has made us rediscover or refine the artistic self. How do you think social arts and art as performance has changed since March and will it continue to change during these ongoing stop-start periods of uncertainty? Hmm, that's a really great question. Um, in some ways it's, I think it's slightly too early to say. I mean obviously the, the the very obvious change that's happened is that, um, you know, it's been more difficult to have um, these shared space, physical kind of spaces, um, and things have become sort of more mediated through like, you know, um, technology and video calls and, um, but I think in some ways, I think, um, I mean, I can't answer this in two ways, because I, th I think the, there's an open question about how, like, um, social arts and performance arts will kind of go on at the moment as a bit of a kind of hybrid, or there has been, depending on, you know, the, the exact nature of the kind of lockdowns. And, you know, over the summer, as we opened up a bit, there was a bit more kind of physical face-to-face -face interactions. And now, sadly, obviously, that's kind of retreating a little bit. But um, and I suspect that will continue as long as we're in this uncertain period. But I think for me, what's interesting is how, like, um, well, interesting, I say, obviously, it's coming out of a very difficult, problematic time, but is just how the everyday now is a bit like performance art in terms of, like, I mean, I think about, like, every time I go into Boots or a shop, you know, this this idea of, like, you're very aware of your, obviously for safety reasons, but in a way there's a kind of weird performance and choreography of that you're really aware of what does it mean to be in proximity to other people um and um i think that's going to be a legacy really in terms of um really thinking about our relationships to other people um and and i, I mean i hope it will mean that it, we have a, a greater appreciation about the things that we've been kind of denied and there's a kind of more of a value about what it means to be in in spaces with people or socializing with people um and we yeah we really kind of value and, and appreciate the worth of those things yeah i think that's really important and i know something that's been discussed a lot um not only in in arts practice but also in the kind of socials and uh, social aspect and in community engagement as well so that kind of value of coming together and shared experiences um we've got another question from liz and liz says thank you lovely to see you and hear you talk about your work hey, um <laughs> you talked about freshness and shared learning within your practice and wondered um, if or how you've managed to continue that in lockdown. Uh, um, is there anything you would recommend to see, watch, listen to do online that you've been inspired by during lockdown? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, lovely to hear from you, Liz. I hope you're well. Um, uh, oh, that's, yeah, gosh. Um, I'm sure like lots of people have been down sort of these like wormholes of kind of sort of research. I just can't think of any right now off the top of my head. Uh, mm, 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 mm. I mean, I've been looking a lot at, um, just because I'm various projects that I've been researching at, um, I've been looking at this sort of like dance marathons um, and histories of sort of like, um, yeah, sort of people kind of coming together and, and, and dancing often in relation to kind of like causes, though like, you know, HIV fundraising or, but even more obscure, like in the 30s, like depression era, sort of dance marathons. 
Um, and I know that there have been some online dance parties as well, which has been interesting. Like, um, so that idea of, you know, um, like, yeah, DJ Zoom calls where like one person is like the DJ and everyone's, you know, zooming in and everyone sort of dance up. So I've been really interested in that as a kind of sort of like um, social space for sharing. I think that's been, yeah, it's been kind of super interesting. Um, yeah, but I know I'm kind of thinking about works Christmas parties and stuff, and is there going to be some dancing happening uh, remotely? I think it might be. <laughs> oh, I hope God. not. But. Yeah, I hope not too. <laughs> um, so we've got another question um, from Joanna or Johanna, sorry if I've got the pronunciation wrong there. Um, so they're asking about the pose that you used um, um, in the motif in your latest project that you touched on and that you saw it as a manifestation of black identity, particularly for males during the 80s. What's your interpretation of that? And what do you think the photographers or performers of this pose were trying to communicate? And there is a, like a follow up question to that. So I'll let you kind of digest that. Um, did you feel you were communicating that same message when you yourself performed the pose in various settings? It's a great question. <laughs> I'm going to quickly answer Liz's question because I've just thought of stuff that I have. Oh, sorry. Okay. Which is, I've been listening to a lot of um, j uh, contemporary jazz music, but there's a whole amazing generation of new jazz artists, um, Black British, female, uh, trumpeters so um i'd really recommend there's this great band called coco roco um and right, they yeah. formed as part of the virtual proms this year it might be still on iplayer but yeah i definitely recommend people check them out and the, the uk british jazz scene uh, some people aren't up, maybe put up by jazz but it's really funky it's a mixture of like afro b and high life as well as like you know kind of contemporary r b as well it's really great um, so definitely check out the UK British jazz scene and Kokoroko. Um, uh, so yeah, back to back to Johanna or Johanna's question. Um, it is um, back in the of back of the time. Uh, what do you think, photographers and performers? Um, it's a good question. I mean, I think um, I guess you're asking what's at stake with these kind of poses and these sort of performances. Really, what's um, I mean, A, there's a kind of just an initial thing about um, like how, what does it mean to present yourself in a particular way? Um, I think it's very difficult to kind of divorce it from the kind of context. So I think, you know, those album covers that I'm looking at are very much coming out of a kind of politics of the 80s. Um, and I think the artist choosing to adopt those poses is to do with like the politics of the 80s. So. So, you know, people like Billy Ocean or Lionel Richie and Michael Jackson, they all represent like in in like popular music, they like crossover artists. So like um, coming out of like um, black genres like R&B and soul and reggae and, and into pop culture. So I think they're adopting these poses that are often about being sophisticated and loungy is about I think often about them appealing to white audiences, if I'm being honest, is about them. Um, so it's a particular strategy. And so I think mean, my idea about readopting these poses is to think about what does that mean now? Um, um, and what does, and by, I think when you represent something, A, it's a way of acknowledging or quoting history, but it's also a way of thinking about how that history operates now for me. Amazing. Thank you so much, Harold. Um, so I thank you everybody for sharing their questions. They're so thoughtful and considered. So thank you. Um, I so you meant we had a little chat before and you've mentioned another project you've you've got going on um, that anyone can get involved with involving a spaceship. <laughs> so do you yeah. want to tell us a little bit more about that? <laughs> yeah, I'm um, I'm working with an organisation called Bold Tendencies, who commission artists to make sculptures 
um, that are sited on this multi-story car park in Peckham in South East London. And every summer they have this kind of like free open sculpture park from May to September. Um, obviously this year it was curbed quite heavily and um, the project that I was doing is, was postponed um, till next summer. Uh, but I am gonna be um, building a replica of uh, a spaceship by a musician called Sun Ra, who's a, uh, who was an American jazz musician, kind of known as the sort of godfather of Afrofuturism. Um, and he made this like amazing uh, film called Space is the Place in the 70s. And it features this spaceship where which he lands um, in. Um, so I'm going to sort of make a scale model of that. And, and sort of Sun Ra was this kind of predictor of the future and really thinking about like alternative futures of blackness and thinking about sci-fi and space as this kind of imaginative place. Um, so I'm asking people to, to think about predictions for the future. Um, and you can submit um, that as a recording, an audio recording, something that you might speak to. It could be music if you make music. It could be it could be a postcard, um, and you can submit that, or you can make a small video. Um, and then this big model of the Sunrise spaceship is actually just going to be a, a, a big speaker. We're going to play out um, a mix tape soundtrack. And then there'll be events where we'll be kind of like showing some of the images that have been produced. So I think, um, and it, it, yeah, if you go to kind of uh, boldtendencies.com website, there's information about the open call um, and what you'll need to do. Um, but yeah, I mean, for me, it's about also the conversation about thinking, you know, it's been a very difficult year. And I think there's a lot of questioning about what, what we want to see, hopefully, and I believe, I do believe that will be at some point an end to, you know, the kind of current pandemic. But what, what do we actually want to come out of that? What do we see? What do we hope for the future? Um, so, yeah, it's an invitation for people to, to, to speculate about the future. And people can be, you can be as playful as people want as well. So, you know, um, yeah. Yeah, humour and playfulness is very much part of your practice. I know Absolutely, that. But yeah. <laughs> I think we're all curious about what the future might bring. So um, I'm definitely going to get my my thinking cap on and 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 have a go at submitting something to that. So thank you. Um, thank you so much, Harold, for your time. Um, I also wanted to say thank you to Rachel and everybody at South Cambridgeshire District Council for enabling this to take place today. Um, also, thank you to Eddie and everybody at Cambridge African Network for inviting us at Kettle Jard to support their programme of events. Um, Thank you, Harold, so much for your time and talking to us today. Um, as I mentioned at the start, you can see Harold and his work as part of an untitled Art on the Conditions of Our Time, which opens at Kettle Jard on the 16th of January in 2021. So something to look forward to after Christmas. Um, and other than that, thank you everybody so much for joining us today. And do, we'll um, share some of the links with um, Rachel and the team at South Cam, so perhaps they can also share that through social media um but thank you once again harold for your time and we'll see you all soon thank you thanks karen thanks everyone thank you so much thank you thank you